audio lecture, The Age of Realpolitik, 1848-1871. This is Lecture 17R. There are a couple of different themes in this lecture. We're theme 1, we're going to talk about the failure of the revolutions of 1848 that we discussed in an earlier unit. Those revolutions, or the failures of them, led to a new age of politics governed by ruthlessly practical leaders who achieved their goals incrementally and efficiently. Incrementally meaning a little bit by a little bit. This new type of politics was exemplified by Napoleon III in France, Count Cavour in Italy, and Otto von Bismarck in Germany you will see some similarities to the ideals of Machiavelli in all of these individuals, the end justifying the means, but also incorporating the more modern ideas of politics with the advent of socialism and socialist tendencies being needed to be incorporated in the government, even in the hands of conservatives in many cases. So again, this is another part of the long 19th century lectures. Uh, the age of realpolitik or the politics of reality or real politics is what we're talking about. And we're going to be covering the Second French Empire, the Crimean War, unification of Germany, unification of Italy, and the Ausgleich, Austro-Hungarian Empire Union. Key concept. Now, the failure of the revolutions of 1848 is what really set the stage for this new era of, um, of politics, this realpolitik era. It really begins in Germany. Um, to review a little bit of what we talked about in the earlier lectures about the revolutions of 1848, nationalists and liberals in the Frankfurt Parliament, also known as the Frankfurt Assembly, failed to get the support of the Prussian King Frederick William IV for a unified Germany. Frederick William IV refused to accept a crown for a united Germany rather than maintaining his absolute authority over the smaller Prussia. He said, I refuse to accept the crown from the gutter and instead claim divine right. You see, even if he could have been the king of a larger Germany, <clears throat> he did not want that instead if that was going to limit his power because, of course, the Frankfurt Assembly was trying to push for a constitutional monarchy. The humiliation of Olmutz uh, is also a part of this. Frederick William IV proposed a plan for German unity on his terms. Austria agreed to accept a plan for German unity only if Prussia accepted the leadership of the German Bund, which Austria had dominated. Then there could be a larger Großdeutsch, or uh, all German-speaking peoples, including Austria and Prussia, under the umbrella of um, a greater Germany. <clears throat> Prussia could not accept its loss of sovereignty, thinking that Austria would be dominant in that German Bund, so they stepped back from this idea of unity. It also, we also see implications from the failed revolutions of 1848 that happened in Italy. Just to review, the Austrian forces were driven out of northern Italy, while French forces were removed from southern Italy and from Sicily. Giuseppe Mazzini, with the protection of Giuseppe Garibaldi in the south, established a short-lived Roman Republic in 1849. But ultimately, the whole thing failed. The failure of the Italian revolutionaries to work together effectively resulted in both Austria and France forcefully taking back control over their portions of Italy, and Italy would remain divided and not unified. Now in the Austrian Empire, also known as the Habsburg Empire, we also review the 1848 revolutions and how they played out. The Hungarian forces that were led by Louis Kossuth went to war against Austria and penetrated to the gates of Vienna. 
the Austrian army, with the help of ethnic minorities in the empire, defeated the Hungarians and preserved the empire, however. And of course, in France, where it all began, the February Revolution in 1848 did result in the overthrow of King Louis Philippe and established the Second French Republic, led by Alphonse Lamartine. Then, the June Days, a few months later, the June Days Revolution, pitted the bourgeoisie against the working class and the conservatives that were supported by the army, and order was restored, and conservatism came back. Louis Napoleon, a conservative, was elected president overwhelmingly of the new Second French Republic. And you will recall that shortly after, he will name himself Emperor Napoleon III, and the Second French Republic ceases to exist. Okay, so this is all part of the emergence of Realpolitik after the failures of the 1848 revolutions, which were dominated by the, um, the ideologies of nationalism, yes, which you know, still is around, but also classical liberalism. The failure of the revolutions of 1848 for liberals and for romantics demonstrated that strong idealism, like classical liberalism, was not enough to accomplish the revolutionary goals. The age of realism replaced romanticism as the dominant philosophy after 1850 as a result. They were a bit disillusioned, if you will. Instead, a political outgrowth of realism was the notion of realpolitik, the accomplishing of one's political goals via practical means rather than having idealism drive political decisions. A new political era emerged where nationalist goals, which are still around, were achieved instead of by revolution they were achieved step by step in Machiavellian fashion. We'll see this happen in places like Germany with German unification finally in the 1870s, Italian unification in the 1860s, and even Hungarian autonomy. In France, Emperor Napoleon III, under Emperor Napoleon III, who had been Louis Napoleon, um, France would have, they would have to cater to liberals in order to maintain effective control, although he still maintained himself as the emperor. So he'll have to make some compromises, although he will still keep his position as emperor. We'll discuss all of these in later slides. Key concept. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of the Crimean War that happened between 1853 and 1856. We've mentioned it in earlier lectures, but we now are going to talk about it in more detail. It shows the failure, ultimately, of the Concert of Europe that had been established at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Its credibility was undermined by the failure of the great powers to cooperate during the revolutions of 1848 and 49, and by the time we get to the Crimean War, the whole thing is pretty much unraveling. Between 1848 and 1878, peace in Europe was interrupted by a couple of different wars, the Crimean War and the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 and 1878. Causes of the Crimean War in the 1850s. Let's discuss this first. The major cause was the dispute between two groups of Christians over privileges in the Holy Land in Palestine. In 1852, the Turks, who at that point controlled Palestine, agreed to France's Emperor Napoleon III's demand to provide enclaves in the Holy Land for the protection of Roman Catholic religious orders that would go there on pilgrimages. This agreement seemed to jeopardize existing agreements which provided access to Greek Orthodox religious orders uh, in that region that Russia favored. Tsar Nicholas I, 
ordered instead Russian troops to occupy several Turkish controlled provinces on the Danube River as a result of this agreement that the Turks made with the French that he saw as encroaching on Russian Greek Orthodox um, um, suzerainty, if you will. Russia would withdraw once the Turks had guaranteed rights for Orthodox Christians though. So this little first part ended in a bit of a draw. The Ottoman Empire, however, was angry about what had happened, and so therefore they declared war on Russia in 1853, when Nicholas refused to completely withdraw from the Danubian provinces. So the draw is over. In 1854, Great Britain and France ultimately saw this as a land grab, a power grab in the Crimean area, the Balkans region, by Russia. Both Great Britain and France had financial and trade interests in this region, and they did not want this region to be dominated by Russia because it would push them out of their economic interests in that region. So Great Britain and France came to the aid, ultimately, of the Ottoman Empire uh, to fight against Russia, not because they really cared about the Ottoman Empire, but because they were looking out for their own financial interests. To some, this was a major surprise, as the Turks were not Christians, yet they were being supported by Britain and France, who were Christian countries. The four points that will eventually uh, come about um, as part of this war include the following provisions. Russia, when they lose this war, they'll have to renounce their claims to the occupied principalities along the Danube River. The navigation in the mouth of the Danube River on the Black Sea will now be internationalized. This was a um, concession given to Great Britain and France for their participation in the war. Russia had to renounce its special role of, quote, protector of Greek Orthodox Christians within the Ottoman Empire as well. Those are the three major points of the four points. The fourth one is not as important. In 1855, Piedmont, which was a, an Italian um, state, uh, joined the war against Russia. Austria also agreed to the four points and gave Russia an ultimatum to comply or Austria would join the war against Russia as well. So this is quickly looking like it's becoming a world war against Russia. The new Tsar at this point, by 1855, had just come to power, Alexander II. He was the son of Nicholas I. Nicholas I's uh, mismanagement, I guess you would say, of the war made Alexander II believe that the only way that Russia was going to be able to survive this was to accept the four points and end the war. Unlike Tsar Nicholas I, who had died, like I said, in 1855, Alexander was opposed to continuing the war because he felt that it would ultimately hurt Russia. And Russia's loss of this war, Alexander thought, was proof that Russia needed to industrialize. The reason they lost this war is because they were so far behind the other nations that participated, especially Great Britain and France when it came to industrial technology that could then be converted into military technology. So fighting the war? Most of the war was fought on the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea, therefore that's why it's called the Crimean War. Over 50,000 British and French troops fought the Russian forces seeking to take back the Black Sea port city of Sevastopol. This war is when Florence Nightingale comes into the picture, especially for the British soldiers. The, she was a British nurse who became a pioneer in modern nursing. During the Korean War, she noticed that more men died of disease and infection rather than by dying in combat of their wounds immediately. So she established what would be known as Nightingale's Light Brigade 
which superbly tended to the wounded men during the war. Although fatalities due to disease remained high, the cleanliness and the care that Nightingale's Light Brigade gave to the British soldiers in particular will push or advance the cause of nursing forever. Florence Nightingale recognized that cleanliness is so important when it comes to um, healing men of their wounds. And if you kept things clean, they would most likely be able to survive a lot better than if you did not. If you think about it, Florence Nightingale is kind of the British equivalent to our own, in America, our own Clara Barton, who served during the uh, Civil War, the American Civil War, which was going on at roughly the same time as the Crimean War. Now, of course, we have another piece of Paris that ends the Crimean War. Of course, why not have another piece of Paris, right? Um, Russia emerged as the big loser, obviously, in the conflict, since they were the ones that had to surrender or sue for peace in 1855. With the Peace of Paris, Russia no longer had control of, over maritime trade along the Danube River. They had to recognize Turkish control of the mouth of the Danube River. And they had to renounce claims to Moldavia and Wallachia, which later became Romania. Russia also had to renounce the role of protector of Greek Orthodox residents in the Ottoman Empire. They no longer could claim to have a, any kind of control over those folks. Russia agreed to return all occupied territories to the Ottoman Empire as well. And of course, the Black Sea was made neutral or internationalized, which is exactly what Great Britain and France wanted, and that's why they participated in the war in the first place. The independence and integrity of the Ottoman Empire was recognized officially and guaranteed as well. The aftermath of the war, of course, Russia was shocked that it had fallen so far behind militarily, especially due to industrialization. And Russia began its move towards industrialization and modernization of its army in particular. More of this will be covered in Lecture 18R. Key concept. Now let's talk about how this new phase of politics, realpolitik, um, manifests itself in different countries. We're going to start by talking about France. It all really begins with the Second French Republic that had been established after the initial revolution of 1848. We know that uh, they declared themselves a republic again. They wrote a new constitution, yet another French constitution. Uh, it created a unicameral legislature, National Assembly, unicameral meaning one house, a strong executive branch, which would be President Louis Napoleon, and th that uh, president would be popularly elected with universal male suffrage. So the reason why Louis Napoleon was able to be elected as the president of this Second French Republic largely had to do with his name recognition. Remember, Napoleon was still seen by many as this great figure, and uh, the French people still loved his legacy. Like I said, universal male suffrage, all men having the right to vote, no property qualifications. Now, as president, what did Louis Napoleon achieve? Between 1848, he was President Louis Napoleon before becoming Emperor Napoleon III. First of all, he was dedicated to law and order because he really was a conservative deep down in his heart. He was opposed to socialism and radicalism, and he favored the conservative classes like the church, army, property owners, and businesses. He had lived much of his life outside of France and thus had little political baggage to rally opponents, or for, for opponents to rally around to oppose him. Voters perhaps were swayed, like I said before, by the Napoleonic legend of greatness and stability and they desired to have another Bonaparte in control if they would be restored to that greatness and stability in France. 
In return for the support of the conservatives, Louis Napoleon had to make some concessions, though. First of all, the Fallot Laws. Louis Napoleon returned the control of education in France to the church in return for its support. Now this is a major change that had happened during the French Revolution where the church lost control of education and now he's giving it back. He minimized also the influence of the legislative assembly. They became more like a rubber stamp to whatever he wanted to do. In other words, he strengthened the executive branch and weakened the legislative branch in the new French Republic. He also supported policies favorable to the army. That was his bread and butter, just like it had been his uncle's bread and butter. He disenfranchised, however, many poor people from voting as uh, he had this power uh, for several years. So that universal male suffrage that was technically in the new French constitution for the Second Republic would be watered down very quickly. So many poor people were banned from voting, usually with things like poll taxes, uh, maybe even literacy tests like the United States had um, after the Civil War. He destroyed also the democratic socialist movement by jailing or exiling its leaders and closing down labor unions throughout France. The Legislative Assembly did not grant Louis Napoleon either payment for his large personal debt or an allowance for a second presidential term, however. So, in response, Louis Napoleon plotted a coup to become emperor, like uncle, like nephew. Eventually, he's able to take control and establish instead the Second Empire or the Liberal Empire. Even though he is really conservative in many ways, it's called the Liberal Empire. What you're going to see with Realpolitik is just like I said before, Machiavellian terms. In some cases you may need to side with the Liberal agenda to get done what you want and then the next year you can turn against that liberal agenda and and turn towards the conservatives to get what you want it's whichever way the wind blows in order to get your achievement done Emperor Napoleon III first of all took control of the government in this coup d'etat in December of 1851 and he became emperor the following year he took the number three instead of two out of uh, respect for the son of Napoleon Bonaparte that never would be able to become an emperor. He restored universal suffrage, however, in 1852 after becoming emperor because like his uncle, he would use universal suffrage with the plebiscite to gain even more power for himself. 92% of the people voted to make him, quote, president for 10 years. In actuality, he was an emperor. France was the only country in Europe at this point, at that time, to provide true universal suffrage. In 1853, 97% of voters agreed to make him a hereditary emperor. So he will officially take the title of emperor at that time, even though technically he had been in control over the government as an emperor really since 1851 in December. Between 1851 and 1859, Napoleon III's control was direct and authoritarian. He strengthened his own centralized power. An imperial aristocracy emerged consisting of wealthy businessmen. He censored the press. No criticism of him would be tolerated. And the government sponsored, quote, official candidates in elections for the National Assembly that would ultimately just be a puppet to the emperor. Between 1859 and 1870, Napoleon III set out to build the liberal empire by initiating now a series of reforms. So he had to take a hard line in the first phase, more conservative. Now that he's got the power he needs, he can shift if he needs to, to build this quote liberal empire by now initiating a series of reforms. 
You see what I mean? By changing the approach, whichever way will gain them the most power at that particular time. It is called political expediency, folks. Napoleon III's rule ultimately provided a model for other political leaders throughout Europe in this era of realpolitik, or the politics of reality. Taking a look at the situation, seeing which way you should go that will grant you the greatest uh, stability for your state and the greatest power. It demonstrated how government could reconcile popular, meaning based on popular support, and conservative forces through authoritarian nationalism. We're still using nationalism, but at this point nationalism is coupled with this authoritarianism rather than classical liberalism anymore. Although he will use some elements of liberalism and some elements even of socialism to gain power and to keep power, he ultimately is staunchly conservative and an authoritarian nationalist. Key concept. Economic reforms throughout France will result in a fairly healthy economy. So it worked. It did create stability in France. And that healthy economy would then be used, much of that money could then be used to rebuild the infrastructure within France. Railroads, canals, roads. Baron Georges von Haussmann is the individual that was put in charge of redeveloping the infrastructure in Paris, one of the greatest cities in the world. The, um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. He's the one that will open up Paris with wide, large boulevards replacing those smaller streets. Um, ultimately uh, making Paris what it is today. The Champs-Élysées is basically a Haussmann invention. Um, there was also a movement towards free trade uh, as part of these economic reforms initiated by Emperor Napoleon III. French exports will double between 1853 and 1864. And he even signed a fairly liberal trade treaty with Great Britain in 1860 that would benefit them both, two of the greatest industrial powers in Europe at the time. Perhaps this was the first time that any modern state had played such a direct role in stimulating the economy. So it's interesting, this is not laissez-faire, this is not allowing supply and demand to really determine the market. It's strictly controlled by the government, but for the benefit of all of the state, ultimately. For example, the banking giant called Credit Mobile was established in 1852. It is a French, major French bank, uh, and they will fund industrial and infrastructure growth, not just within France, but all throughout Europe. They became an international bank that other nations would invest in and, tr and borrow from to grow their own infrastructure. It was one of the world's most important financial institutions in the 1850s and 1860s as a result. It's like the city bank of the day. France's metallurgical industry began to rival Great Britain's during this time and French investors financed large infrastructure projects in places like Russia, Spain, and Italy. Why would they do that? Well, they knew that these nations needed these things, and if they invested in them, then their trade goods could, um, have, uh, press, could have precedence over, you know, dominating those areas in the, when it came to trade. The Suez Canal in Egypt was an example of this. It was completed in 1869 and it was financed by French investors from Credit Mobile. Political reforms were also part of Napoleon III's um, um, initiatives. Napoleon III extended the power of the Legislative Assembly, oddly enough, in the second half of his, of his rule. Members would be elected by universal suffrage every six years. Opposition candidates had greater freedom even. 
but and he returned control of secondary education to the government once again instead of the Catholic Church. So you see he's taken a 180 from what he had been before. Realpolitik. This is the way the wind is blowing at this particular time in French politics. In response, Pope Pius IX issued the Syllabus of Errors in 1864, condemning liberalism. So even though technically Emperor Napoleon III was not a true classical liberal, because he was initiating some liberal reforms, uh, he was seen by the Pope as, as uh, not good for Catholicism. And so condemning liberalism as a sin was the Pope's response. Napoleon III also permitted trade unions and their right to strike by 1864. Sounds like a classical liberal, doesn't he? He eased censorship and granted amnesty to political prisoners. He supported better housing for the working class throughout France. And he supported credit unions and the regulation of pawn shops even. Foreign policy struggles resulted in strong criticism of Napoleon III, however, and it demonstrated his weakness as a ruler. He was better domestically than he was in foreign policy. First of all, he sent French troops to Italy to rescue and restore Pope Pius IX. Uh, earlier on, this is prior to the syllabus of errors being um, issued by Pope Pius IX. This was still when they were friends. Um, and the French troops will remain in Italy between 1849 and 1870 as a result. And that kind of spreads the French military a bit thin. He was condemned by supporters of the French Republic, the Second French Republic, but, uh, although he was supported by conservatives and mo moderates. Uh, French involvement in the Crimean War angered some of those who had supported the Second French Republic and some liberals, true liberals, although much of Europe really saw Napoleon III as the victor in the war, so ultimately he didn't mind that so much. The issue of colonialism in Algeria and other French colonies in Africa, Indochina, and even Mex and Mexico became a contentious political issue with anti-imperialists throughout the world. We'll talk more about imperialism in a later lecture. Napoleon's or Emperor Napoleon III's liberal reforms were done in part to divert attention from unsuccessful foreign policy. He kept the people at home in France happy with these liberal reforms so they couldn't criticize him over what was going on uh, with his foreign policy, which was kind of abysmal. It worked like a charm. The Franco-Prussian War between 1870 and 1871, however, resulted in the capture of Napoleon III by the, the Prussians, and it ultimately resulted in the collapse of the Second French Empire. We'll talk more specifically about this war when we discuss realpolitik in Germany later in this lecture. This picture here shows you Napoleon III on the left with Chancellor Bismarck from Prussia. They're conferring after Napoleon's defeat and capture at the Battle of Sedan in 1871. Key concept. Italian unification. After the collapse of the revolutions of 1848 and 49, the unification movement in Italy shifted to a different place. It had started in Rome back in those earlier revolutions. Now it will shift to Sardinia, Piedmont, sometimes just known as Piedmont, under their own king, Victor Emmanuel II. It also was galvanized by Camillo, um, or sorry, Count Camillo Cavour, as well as Giuseppe Garibaldi from um, the earlier revolutions. Now Count Cavour was the Prime Minister of Piedmont. They had a constitutional monarchy under King Victor Emmanuel II and he became the Prime Minister that sort of galvanized the movement for a new unification process in the late 1850s into the 1860s. The new unification movement replaced that earlier movement under people like Giuseppe Mazzini, the once liberal Pope Pius IX, and Ghiberti. Uh, 
Realpolitik was a policy um, that was used, as we have talked about this entire lecture, as a policy that emerged instead of the ideal of romanticism for unification in Italy. It's a very Machiavellian approach to practical politics, use of warfare, raw power, and deceit, if necessary, to achieve the goal of creating a stable state. Here is King Victor Emmanuel II, the King of Sardinia Piedmont, or just Piedmont, between 1849 and 1861. And after the unification of Italy occurred, he became the King of the Unified Italy, between 1861 and 1878. You will note on many of these uh, figures, by the time we get to the late 19th century, um, and even into the early 20th century, a lot of these figures have the same crazy mustache, handlebar mustache. So I'm just pointing that out just because it's kind of fun to point that out as we go through these different people. Now, I mentioned before Count Camillo Benso de Cavour. Um, between 1810 and 1861, those are his years of life. Uh, he was uh, eventually the... Um, galvanizer or the architect behind the uh, unification movement in Italy. He led the struggle for Italian unification through his position in Sardinia Piedmont. He served as King Victor Emmanuel II's Prime Minister between 1852 and 1861. He was essentially a moderate nationalist as well as an aristocratic liberal. He was the editor of a newspaper before he entered political life. Uh, it was called Il Resurgimento, which means the resurgence. And this newspaper was a nationalistic newspaper in Italy, arguing that Sardinia should be the foundation of a new unified Italy. And this is because Sardinia, or Sardinia Piedmont, had a stable constitution, had a constitutional monarch, and therefore, they could lead the rest of Italy into unifying to create a stable, classically liberal state. It is important to note that with these unification movements in places like Italy and Germany, yes, they all use realpolitik combined with nationalism, but we also need to note that the governments that they end up forming end up mimicking the governments around which they unify. For example, because Sardinia Piedmont was a classically liberal constitutional monarchy, Italy will eventually have a classically liberal constitutional monarchy as a united nation. In Germany, because Prussia was the nucleus around which they unify, and Prussia had an authoritarian government under an absolute monarchy, we will see that the German Empire will have the same kind of government, authoritarian, absolute monarchy. So, he guided Sardinia Piedmont into a liberal and economically viable state. Sardinia Piedmont's constitution was modeled on the French constitution of 1830. Some civil liberties were guaranteed, parliamentary government with elections was guaranteed, and parliamentary control over taxation. He also worked through this uh, constitution to reform the judicial system. And they also built up the infrastructure, roads, canals, ports, etc. in Sardinia Piedmont, a classically liberal government. The law on convents and the Sicardi law sought to reduce the influence of the Catholic Church in Sardinia Piedmont. Since they are a classically liberal state, they want to reduce the influence of organized religion. In response, however, Pope Pius IX, who had initially been a proponent of Italian unification back in 1848, issued his Syllabus of Errors, 1864, which we discussed in an earlier slide, warning Catholics against liberalism, rationalism, socialism, and the separation of church and state, but especially religious liberty. It was also a response, as I said earlier, 
to France's secular, secularization of education during the same period under Napoleon III. Key concept. Key concept. Cavour sought to unify for the northern and central areas of Italy. He sought to uni unify those areas first. But in order to do that, he was going to have to throw out the Austrian overlords in those territories. He wanted northern Italy to join with Sardinia Piedmont, and that to be the beginning of a unification movement. Then from there, after taking northern Italy, he hoped he could move down the Italian peninsula to unify the entire thing. In 1855, Sardinia Piedmont found it prudent to join Britain and France in, their, uh, in supporting them in the Crimean War against Russia. And by doing this, they gained France as an ally. They knew this would be important. Cavour knew this would be important for Sardinia Piedmont if they wanted to oust the Austrians out of northern Italy. France was a natural enemy of Austria. They would need France's help if they were going to go to war with Austria to try to liberate northern Italy to unify with Sardinia Piedmont. And it worked like a charm. In 1858, Cavour, as the um, representative of Sardinia Piedmont, since he was the prime minister, met at Plombieres with Emperor Napoleon III of France. Cavour gained a promise from Napoleon III at that meeting that France would support a Sardinian war with Austria in order to create a northern Italian kingdom that would be ultimately controlled by Sardinia Piedmont. Piedmont would annex a number of Italian states such as Venice, Lombardy, Parma, Modena, and even part of the northern Papal States. In return for their support, France would receive Savoy and Nice on the Mediterranean. So Austria declared war on Sardinia in 1859 after being provoked, basically. Uh, and ultimately, this will uh, work out well for Sardinia. The 1859 meeting between Emperor Napoleon III and Victor Emmanuel II is pictured below. Their agreement to uh, go to war with Austria. Ultimately, that will be the beginning of the unification movement in Italy. Sardinia Piedmont will gain control over Lombardy, although not Venetia, as a result of its 1859 war with Austria. With the French backing, they were able to defeat Austria and gain those northern territories in Italy. France briefly came to Sardinia's aid, as I said, in 1859. Yet, France will actually back away from all of the Plombier's agreements due to fears of war with Prussia that at that point was Austria's, um, Austria's ally, so to speak. Austria's strength and military power also started to concern France uh, and also revolutionary unrest in northern Italy. Uh, the French public's concern over war with a Catholic Austria also forced Napoleon III to back off on their support a bit. However, at the very beginning of the war, that support was enough to push Austria into an agreement to let go of some of those northern territories to Piedmont. In 1860, Cavour arranged for the annexation of Parma, Modena, Romagna and Tuscany that now became part of a greater Sardinia Piedmont. Northern Italy was now unified with Sardinia Piedmont and from there that he had a foothold he hoped to move down the Italian peninsula. France as I said supported Cavour in return for receiving those territories Nice and Savoy. Now the southern part of Italy needed to be um, galvanized once again in order to hopefully form a union with northern Italy. And then they hoped that they could then sandwich central Italy, which was the Papal States, into submission, even though the Pope did not support this movement initially. So, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who had been a mover and shaker in the earlier 
uh, unification, sorry, yes, the early nationalist unification movements in 1848 and 49, will be responsible for liberating southern Italy and Sicily. Garibaldi exemplified the romantic nationalism of the earlier Giuseppe Mazzini and the earlier Young Italy revolutionaries of 1848. He was able to get the support of nationals in southern Italy and uh, ultimately, after throwing off the king of the kingdom of uh, Naples or kingdom of Sicily, the two Sicilies, they will join with the Sardinians in the national unification movement. In May of 1860, Garibaldi and his thousand red shirts landed in Sicily and extended the nationalist activity into southern Italy and ousted the king of the two Sicilies. By September, Garibaldi had taken control over Naples as well as all the rest of the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Although Cavour distrusted Garibaldi in some ways, worried that he would try to take over completely, Victor Emmanuel II encouraged Garibaldi's exploits in the south of Italy, hoping that it would uh, bring about full Italian unification. At least they could squeeze this, the Pope into submission, hopefully. Cavour insisted that Sardinia Piedmont be the foundation of the Italian nation as the center of the Italian nation and therefore uh, control the Italian nation. Garibaldi thus allowed his conquest to be absorbed into Sardinia Piedmont. He recognized that the power of Sardinia Piedmont with control over northern Italy would be too much for him to challenge. So if you can't be the head of a new unified Italy yourself, you at least want to be part of that unified Italy. Here is an 1860 cartoon with Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel II. You see Garibaldi is delivering the southern part of Italy to Victor Emmanuel II, who of course was the king of Sardinia Piedmont. The right leg in the boot at last. In February of 1861, Victor Emmanuel was declared Victor Emmanuel I, King of Italy. His number was two when he was the King of Sardinia Piedmont, but his number was one as the first Victor Emmanuel to be King of a United Italy. And he would preside over an Italian parliament that was created, which would represent all of Italy, except for two small parts that would remain out of this unification movement for the next five or six years. Mm, well, actually more like 10 years. And that would be Rome and Venice. So Victor Emmanuel II of Sardinia Piedmont became Victor Emmanuel I, King of Italy. Here's the Victor Emmanuel monument that is in Rome today. In 1866, Venetia would finally incorporate it into the Italian kingdom as a result of an alliance with the German Chancellor Bismarck. She'll talk more about that later. Sardinia had agreed to open up a front against Austria during the Austro-Prussian War in 1866 in return for its annexation of Venetia. In 1871, finally, Rome was squeezed into submission to supporting this unification. It was captured by Italian troops and became the capital, ultimately, of the Kingdom of Italy. That was basically the compromise that was made. The new pope agreed to come along with the unification movement as long as Rome would be the capital, the center of the new Kingdom of Italy. So, in actuality, 1861 is the date when we have a unified Italy, but by 1871 is when we have all of Italy included. France had just been defeated by Germany in the Franco-Prussian War in the same year and could no longer defend the Papal States, so that's why the Pope had to compromise and submit. Stages of Italian unification are illustrated here on this movable map showing you which parts were added when. It's kind of interesting, actually. So you can take a look at that on your own later. Little bit by little bit, 
And there we go. Though politically unified, a great social and cultural gap separated the progressive industrializing northern part of Italy from the stagnant agrarian southern part of Italy. Key concept. Now let's talk about German unification under the Hohenzollerns, the Prussian kings. After 1815, as we've discussed, Prussia emerged as an alternative to a Habsburg-based German confederation. In 1849, Austria had blocked the attempt of Frederick William IV of Prussia to unify Germany from above. This was known as the humiliation of Olmutz, and we discussed it in an earlier lecture. Thus, the Grossdeutsch plan for creating a unified Italy that incorporated all German-speaking peoples failed. This is because Austria did not want to subject themselves to the authority of the Prussians. If all German-speaking peoples unified under Prussia, that would mean Austria would have to submit to Prussia. So the Grossdeutsch, meaning big Germany, that plan will fail. The idea for a unified Germany, including Prussia and Austria, will die. Instead, they will take a smaller approach, Kleindeutsch, smaller Germany. It all really can be traced back to an, a, an earlier customs union that was formed under the German Confederation, the Bund, called the Zollverein. It was actually created as early as 1734, and it was the biggest source of tension between Prussia and Austria. Uh, Austria and Prussia kind of struggled for which nation would control this uh, customs union um, economically, and this sort of sowed the seeds for the fact that they would not ever be able to unify as one nation with the two of them in it those two big nations, Prussia and Austria. Ultimately, the Zollverein excluded Austria, and Austria thus tried unsuccessfully to destroy it. The Kleindeutsch plan, smaller Germany, the idea of a unified Germany without Austria, was now seen as the most practical means of unification among various German states, particularly Prussia, especially after the failed attempts in 1848. Otto von Bismarck is the architect of German unification, much like Cavour was the architect of Italian unification. Okay, Otto von Bismarck led the drive for a Prussian-based Hohenzollern Germany. He would be the chancellor of Prussia and would ultimately become the chancellor of a unified Germany. Chancellor is just the German word for prime minister. He had a Junker background, who had, he was obsessed with power. He was a Junker, meaning the upper middle class uh, folks in the German states, uh, especially Prussia, as we've talked about in many, many different units. Um, the gap theory gained Bismarck's favor with the king, which basically said there was an army bill crisis that created a stalemate between the king and the legislature over reforms to the army. Now, yes, Prussia was more of an authoritarian type of state, but they did technically have a legislature, although that legislature was made up of very conservative people that usually supported the king. There was, however, a gap between them over this army bill crisis. Bismarck, who was the chancellor, um, insisted that the, Prince, the Prussian constitution contained this gap, that it did not mention what was to be done if a stalemate between the legislature and the king developed. See, this is not your typical uh, regular constitutional monarchy. This legislature was not really a constitutionally elected type of legislature. And typically, they had rubber-stamped the policies of the king. But now there's a gap. What to do when there's this gap, when there's a disagreement between the two? Since the king had granted the constitution, Bismarck insisted that he ignore those middle-class liberals in the legislature at this point, 
who were trying to challenge him on this issue. And he basically said, you're the king. Nobody is higher than you. So you can follow your own will and your own judgment when it comes to this. He said, Bismarck said, the great questions of the day will not be decided by speeches and resolutions. That was the blunder of 1848 and 1849. But instead, these questions will be settled by blood and iron. It's the great blood and iron speech of Otto von Bismarck. And that is why we start talking about realpolitik. Okay, blood and iron determine the movements and the political movements of the day rather than pie in the sky idealism of the enlightenment or even romantic notions of nationalism. The government will continue to collect taxes even though the parliament refused to approve the budget as a result of this gap theory that Bismarck proposed to the king. Voters countered by sending liberal majorities to the Reichstag, that is the Prussian parliament, between 1862 and 1866, but to no avail because the king had the support of the chancellor. So ultimately, they will overrule anything that the more um, liberal uh, Reichstag will propose. Bismarck oversaw a number of reforms that improved the Prussian military even more. He will launch a series of wars to try to gain territory to add to Prussia. And ultimately, with this series of wars, he will take territories and that will become the process for unifying Germany around Prussia, seizing territory little bit by little bit and eventually forming a unified Germany. What was interesting about Bismarck is he already knew before he went to war with one nation who he would go to war with next. He had the whole thing planned out before he started. And ultimately, he would make an ally with a nation, go to war with another nation, and whomever was his ally in that war would be who he would attack in the next war. So let's talk about this process, how he does this. The first in the series of wars launched by Bismarck in this realpolitik world was the Prussian-Danish War in 1863. Germany approached, sorry, I should say Prussia at this point because it's not really a unified Germany yet. Prussia and Austria will ally to go to war against Denmark and take control over the provinces of Schleswig and Holstein. Prussia, through Bismarck, had promised Austria control over one of these territories while Prussia would take control over the other. The provinces were jointly administered, really, by Prussia and Austria, but conflicts over who would really have jurisdiction over which area led to a major war between Prussia and Austria next. This was actually what Bismarck had planned all along. He never planned on letting Austria remain in control over either of these provinces. So, the Prussian-Danish War gained those territories, and eventually, this will lead to a war, this time, with Austria. Remember, whoever was his ally in the previous war will be who it attacks in the next. So, in 1866, the Austro-Prussian War is launched. It's also known as the Seven Weeks War, or the German Civil War, where Bismarck and Prussia sought a localized war to gain the territories back from Austria that they had allowed them to have some control over from the previous Danish war. He made diplomatic preparations for war with Austria by negotiating with the enemies, the natural enemies of Austria, France, Italy, and Russia. Now, they weren't really allying with him in the idea of you know, giving him arms to fight against Austria. But what he got from those three nations is their guarantee to not interfere if he ended up going to war with Austria. Prussia's use of railroads to amass troops and to use the, its use of breech-loading rifles 
proved superior to Austria's military efforts, and Austria was defeated within seven weeks. Prussia's victory over Austria unified much of Germany already without Austria. Most all of the northern German states that had been part of the Bund now joined with Prussia to become a more unified Germanic state. But the southern part of Germany that still remained predominantly Catholic and that had been in trade uh, relationships with France for many years were a bit wary about joining in this larger Germany. But this is part of showing why the Kleindeutsch plan will prevail. A Germany, a smaller Germany without Austria in it. Now, Austria was given generous peace terms even though they were defeated in this war. And that will go a long way in the future because Bismarck recognized that eventually um, Prussia, if they did unify Germany completely, they will eventually need a powerful ally on the east, um, on the eastern side of them. And that will be Austria, naturally. So they gave generous peace terms, so in the future, their relationship would not be as strained. Italy also received some territories for their non-interference. Uh, Venice um, was given to them from Austria. I mentioned that in the earlier slide when we talked about Italian unification. All right, so here we go. German Civil War or the Austro-Prussian War. In 1867, the North German Confederation was established by Bismarck with King William I or Wilhelm I as president. He had been the king of Prussia now he is the king of a northern German confederation. This is the beginning, this first step towards creating a unified German empire. It included all of the German states except Baden, Württemberg, Bavaria, and Saxony, which were more southern territories. The, feder the federal constitution allowed each state to retain its own local government and the parliament, the Reichstag, which had been the parliament or basically the legislature of Prussia, uh, consisted of two houses that shared power equally. Now again, even though this is a parliament, it is still a very authoritarian regime under the power of King William I. It is not a, um, a traditional constitutional monarchy type government. The upper house, the Bundesrat, included representatives from each state. And the lower house, the Bundestag, had representatives elected by universal male suffrage. So even though this is a traditionally conservative state, they do utilize some uh, more liberal principles, universal male suffrage, in order to get the job done. The new government structure gave Bismarck the ability to circumvent the middle class ultimately by appealing directly to the working classes, just as Napoleon III had done in France. So they kind of steal the thunder from the middle class as the, you know, ones that normally utilize nationalism coupled with classical liberalism to push the idea of unification. Instead, he made nationalism in Germany a conservative cause. And ultimately, by giving in to the desires of the working classes through universal male suffrage, and as we will see eventually some social reforms, he gains their support and undercuts the power of the middle class. Thus, the German middle class did not regain its influence in Germany until World War I. The last war will be the Franco-Prussian War. This will be the last war for German unification. And it happens between 1870 and 1871. Now you probably can already figure out who he's a, um, attacking in this war. It's France. France had agreed to remain, you know, that non-interference, almost like an ally, <laughs> against Austria um, in the previous war. And so they're going to be the target in this next war. 
This was actually done by Bismarck on purpose because he wanted to make sure those southern German principalities would willingly join with the northern German principalities to form a true unified German empire. Those southern principalities that were close to France, that had had trade agreements with France, that were Catholic like France was, were wary about this association. So he was going to have to use some deceit, some Machiavellian deceit, in order to get this job done. He also had to use deceit because he did not want to appear the aggressor on the world stage when it came to this war. He needed to figure out a way to get France to declare war on Prussia first so then Prussia would look like they were defending themselves and this happens with the Ems dispatch also known as the Ems telegram in 1870 now there's a lot of um, kind of intrigue going on here ultimately what the what happened here is Bismarck was seeking like I said to provoke a war with France trying to get France to declare war first so Prussia does not look like the instigator uh, and, and to do this in order to further unify Germany to take those southern territories and eventually even annex Alsace and Lorraine which had belonged to France since after the Napoleonic Wars Bismarck did this by boasting in a telegram that was leaked to the press that a French diplomat had been kicked out of Germany after asking Kaiser or King William I not to interfere with the succession to the Spanish throne. Now, this was a complete lie. This did not happen, but it made it look like that French diplomat was uh, being insulting towards Germany. And by lying about it, then Napoleon III, Emperor of France, was insulted. And therefore, that is what got him to ultimately declare war against Prussia. I know it sounds silly. There's a lot more um, things going on in the background here. Just suffice it to say, ultimately, the Prussians were able to... um, get France to declare war first. The alleged snub, if you will, was exaggerated by Bismarck intentionally in the press in order to provoke France. And it worked. An infuriated France under Emperor Napoleon III declared war against Germany, but really it was against Prussia, which was becoming a united Germany. You see a picture here of Uh, Kaiser or King William or Wilhelm I of Prussia and Count Benedetti, the French ambassador to Prussia, okay, at Bad Ems. That's where the Ems dispatch happened. Bismarck used the war with France ultimately to bring the four remaining southern German states into the northern German confederation. So quickly those states, those four states that weren't sure if they wanted to join in with Germany because of their close ties to France, saw France as an instigator. They believed Bismarck when they said that, when he said that France was trying to take territories away from them, including Alsace and Lorraine, um, trying to maintain, use those as a foothold to take other southern German territories. Ultimately, it was a big mess. And those nations, those German states, will join with Prussia and the rest of the northern states. The apparent ease with which Prussia defeated France sent shockwaves throughout Europe as well. The Prussian military was far superior to the French military. And ultimately, it shocked the rest of Europe, This how they had used industrial technology to mechanize weapon making, ultimately uh, set everybody on alert for an aggressive, expans- expansion-minded Germany. Okay, Prussia becoming now Germany, unifying those German territories around them. Paris ultimately would be surrounded by the Prussian troops. That's the capital city of France, remember. And Emperor Napoleon III will refuse to give in. Uh, After uh, Paris was encircled for a while, they actually, the Prussian troops, uh, would not allow 
supplies in to help feed the people of Paris. The people of Paris started to starve to death. They hoped that this would force Napoleon III to back down. He did not. The people of Paris had to actually break into their zoo and start slaughtering the animals in the zoo in order to feed themselves. It was terrible. Um, ultimately, Napoleon III will uh, meet on the battlefield with the Prussian troops one last time and in January of 1871, and he will be captured in battle. Ultimately, this will force France to surrender to Prussia, which is now referred to as a unified German nation. This last war, the Franco-Prussian War, is ultimately what creates the German Empire. The battles of Sedan and Metz were particularly de decisive in Prussia's victory. And this led to the Treaty of Frankfurt, May of 1871 where Alsace and Lorraine were ultimately ceded to Germany. This will cause a lot of bitterness in the minds of many French people. They were angry over the loss of these territories that they had gained control over um, after the Napoleonic Wars. And they uh, ultimately had this animosity that their their emperor, Emperor Napoleon III, would be deposed by this. And they got angry, angrier and angrier at a new German nation as a result. This desire for revenge on the part of the French goes a long way to explain why after World War I, where France and Germany are on opposite sides, and Germany ends up on the losing side, why France wanted revenge against Germany when it came to the treaty that ended that war. We will see how France has a long memory. They seek revenge against Germany and they will take it in that treaty that ends World War I, the Versailles Treaty. We'll talk more about that later. That's kind of a, you know, foreshadowing of things to come. Here's the southern German states that joined in uh, 1870 to form the German Empire. They are in orange. Alsace and Lorraine, the territory annexed following the Franco Prussian War in 1871, is in the paler orange on the far, far left. So the German Empire was proclaimed on January 18, 1871. Germany was now the most powerful nation in all of Europe, military wise and even wealth wise in many ways. William I, also known as Wilhelm I, became the Emperor of Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm I. Kaiser just means king in German. Bismarck became the Imperial Chancellor, so the Imperial Prime Minister. And the German Empire's government was essentially the same federal structure that had been established in 1866 for Prussia and the surrounding northern German states that had joined with them. It would be an authoritarian state, even though they did have a Reichstag, a legislature. It was really more of a rubber stamp for whatever the prime minister, the chancellor, and the king, Kaiser Wilhelm I, wanted to do. Conservatism will reign supreme. In reality, that Reichstag had little power as the German Empire became a conservative autocracy, with ultimately the nobility allied with the monarch and the nobility of course represented by that iron chancellor himself Otto von Bismarck key concept the last thing we're going to talk about is what happens with the Austro-Hungarian Empire yes we've been calling it the Austrian Empire but now it's going to become what's known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire with a dual monarchy after the Austro-Prussian War, the Austrian government had to address some national aspirations of some of its ethnic groups. One of those ethnic groups was the Hungarians that had been pushing for um, a, a, the creation of a Hungarian state since 1848. They were one of those 1848 challengers. The Hungarians and the Czechs continued to demand self-determination or at the very least, semi-autonomous states 
within the, the Austrian Empire. Austria's defeat by Germany in 1866 weakened its grip on power and forced it to make a compromise with the Hungarians and establish a so-called dual monarchy. The only way they can maintain some kind of control over Hungary is to offer them a dual monarchy. What formed this dual monarchy between Austria and Hungary is the Ausgleich or Compromise of 1867. Officially, it creates what's now known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Hungarians now had their own assembly, their own cabinet, and their own administrative system. But it still would support and participate with Austria in the imperial army and in the imperial government. So they had some local governings in their own hands, but they still supported the overall imperial government and imperial army. The results of this compromise, Austria will assimilate the Hungarians, those Magyars who were the traditional Hungarians that were pushing for nationalism since the 1848 revolution, and they nullified them as a primary opposition group. So it actually worked out very well for both parties. It also led to a more efficient government for Austria. Here's the Austro-Hungarian Empire after Ausgleich. Here are the different ethnic groups of the Austro-Hungarian Empire by 1910, according to uh, the distribution of races in Austria-Hungary by William Shepard, 1911. So you see there's lots of different ethnic groups here. They still have that to deal with. It's still a polyglot empire. But now that Hungary has a little bit of autonomy, the biggest um, ethnic group that was pushing for independence from Austria was no longer pushing for that independence because they saw themselves as almost like an equal partner with the Austrians now in maintaining control over this empire. So managing the empire, the government was not integrated really due to differences among various ethnic groups. The language used in government and school was particularly a particularly divisive issue. Uh, in Bohemia, the Czechs that had wanted independence before in 1848 as well, um, it, there was a real issue with this. The issue with whether schools should use the Czech or German language became a particularly sticky issue. Efforts by both conservatives and socialists throughout the empire to try to diffuse national antagonisms by stressing economic issues instead proved unsuccessful. Universal male suffrage was not granted in the Austro-Hungarian Empire until 1907 either. Key concept. Anti-Semitism was also profound in Austria, another issue that will be on the rise as we, as we move towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And this is not just happening in Austria, folks. This is happening in other places as well, in France with the um, Dreyfus Affair, here with uh, Karl Luger uh, as, as the mayor of Vienna. Um, Anti-Semitism or a kind of prejudice against Jews was something that we have seen have waves of popularity throughout uh, the history of Europe. And here it has another wave peaking once again. Jewish populations in Austrian cities grew rapidly after Jews obtained full legal equality in 1867. By 1900, though, Jews comprised 10% of the population in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this concerned many of the traditionalists. Many Jewish business people were successful in banking and trade, while Jewish artists, intellectuals, and scientists emerged as dominant, like Freud, for example. German extremists who were still, they, yes, they were part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, but they were German by descent, uh, 
German or Germanic, I should say, extremists charged Jews with trying to control the economy and cor corrupting the traditional German culture of Austria with alien ideas and ultra modern art. Magyar rule in Hungary. The Magyar nobility in 1867 restored the constitution of 1848 and used it to dominate both the Magyar peasantry and the minority populations until 1914. Only the wealthiest 25% of adult males had the right to vote in the Hungarian elections. Laws promoting the use of the Magyar language in schools and government were especially resented by Croatians and Romanians who were part of the Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. After 1871, the Habsburg leadership lost the initiative to resolve the empire's important divisive uh, issues. Unlike most major countries which used nationalism to strengthen the state after 1871, ultimately the Austro-Hungarian Empire was progressively weakened and then eventually destroyed by it, as we will see moving forward. 